So welcome back. Today is going to be all about tools, but what we're not going to talk about is everything that you probably have in your workbench already, including wrenches and sockets and pliers and screwdrivers and hammers. Hopefully you don't need those. We're not going to talk about electrical tools. We're going to do a whole separate video on that. And we're not going to talk about tools that we use for bending and flaring aluminum. It's just going to be the basic tools that you need to construct a metal aircraft. So the basic metal shaping, we have obviously files, we have emery cloth to smooth up the edges of the aluminum. And every piece of metal that you get in the kit is going to need to be filed, especially in the corners where the flanges are bent to make sure that there's no stress risers. So some small files to get access in there and then a bigger file on the side and then we round all of the edges as well again to get rid of any area where there could be stress and this tool an edge deburring tool can be used usually on parts that are a bit more abrasive than this but can be a quick way to clean up the edges and then I always finish it off with 150 grit emery cloth should be nice and smooth to the touch when you're all finished you can use a cut polish wheel like you see here do not use this on big skins since they can easily get caught and wrecked. Hold the part at an angle at first so you don't create the grooves in the cut wheel like you see there. And it really works better for thicker material. So a bit of work there and it's all nicely polished. Hand seamers are used to make sure that the flanges of all the ribs or the parts are 90 degrees to each other if required, which in most cases they are. So it's simply holding the part down on a flat surface and then making sure everything's 90 degrees. It'll be a little bit off coming out of certain molds. Fluting pliers are used to straighten the ribs. So you'll see that in between where the rivets lie, so you have to make sure you know where the rivets are, the part tends to be a little bit bowed and it's usually high in the center. So you would normally hold this on a flat surface, but I'm just holding it up so you can see it on the camera. And you create little dents in between the rivets to make sure that the part is flat. And when it's laying on a flat surface, you should then be able to push on it without seeing any bow in the parts. So you have to do that for a lot of ribs. Some nice accurate measuring tools. So get some stainless rulers that are accurate to within 1 seconds of an inch. And this is a neat tool, an edge marker which will make your life easy when, you're draw when you just want to draw a straight line reference an edge of a part. Tin snips from your local hardware store, one left and one right. You could probably get away with using a Dremel tool in kind of an RV kit, but every once in a while you'll have to cut off a little piece. Now getting into Clico and drilling, we have color coded, so we're going to talk about number 40, 30, 19, and 12 individually here. And these are Clicos, which are just spring-loaded fasteners, temporary. So we drill a hole, put a Clico in it, so everything's held nice and accurately aligned. And then we can drill a second hole and just quickly repeat that. So the whole aircraft will be covered in Clicos as you go through and drill it. Here's a few special ones on the left. One that's for kind of close tolerance areas where you don't have a lot of room for a Clico. Works the same way, just shorter. And a side clamp. Might need a few of these to hold things in place as you're fixing structure together. And here's another special Clico. This is number 31 for an eighth inch hole. And this is used for when you need a really strong fastener, such as drilling the rear spar. This is not a full list of all the drill bits you'll use, but they're all numbered drill bits. Why do we use numbered drill bits? Because they're a little bit bigger than the rivet size. So 3 32nd inch rivet is that dimension number 40 be a little bit bigger. And it's silver colored, so all these are color coded. Number 30 for 8th inch rivets is copper. Use a number 28 bit for number 6 screws. Number 19 bit for number 8 screws, and they're black. And a number 12 bit for AN3 bolts, and they are gold colored. And a quarter inch drill bit for AN4 bolts. I use a drill stop on number 40 and number 30 bits to keep the drill from hitting the airplane as well as maybe not wanting to drill too far in. Maybe there's structure behind where you're drilling. 
You're going to want to get a pneumatic drill so you get high speed accurate drilling but you will need a small cordless one to get into tight areas. Unibits for creating bigger holes very useful. There's some plexi bits on the right there for drilling canopy later. And then an assortment of 6 inch and 12 inch drill bits you'll find very useful in certain applications. Angled bits you'll definitely need these. And same kind of assortment, number 40, 30, 28, 19, 12, and then some bigger ones perhaps. So there's a variation of lengths uh, that you'll probably need throughout your project. And they just screw off, and the thread on these is common. It's even common on the countersink bits and the deburring bits. So if you ever need to put a countersink bit in there, uh, you could do that as well. It's all the same thread. Now as far as deburring and dimpling, here's a simple little deburring tool with an extension that you'll use on every single hole, front and back, and it's just a couple quick little turns to get rid of any little burr. You don't want to be removing material here, you just want to get rid of the burr around the edge. So it's a very light couple spins. And for dimpling, any aluminum that's less than 40 thou thick, we would dimple if required, but if it's thicker than 40 thou, like this 63 thou angle, then we actually machine countersink it, if required of course, where we're going to actually remove material. So using the hand squeezer, if you can get around the edge for dimpling, and you can just spin the throat of the die there until the two parts contact each other, and then I just give it another half spin after to make sure that I get a nice dimple. And that creates the nice dimple for a flush 332nd inch rivet. For confined areas, we might have these dimpling pliers, and these will be used typically on the trailing edge of a rib, where we can't get the hand squeezer in but we still have access from the side. So this gives us a nice uh, access to tight areas. We have those in number 40 and number 30. Now, pneumatic squeezer, we'll talk about this a lot, but always remember this is 3000 PSI, so don't pull that trigger until you're absolutely sure. But you can use it for dimpling if you're very careful. Some different dies, so we had number 40 bit Previously, there's a number 30 for 8th inch rivets. And then countersinking screws. We have dimple dies for number 6. And for number 8 screws as well. And you can see this one's ground down. A common thing in aircraft tools tend to have limited access. So obviously that die at some point was used somewhere where there's a quite tight fit. Here's a C-frame dimpler. This is what you're going to use to dimple all the big parts like the wing skins and the fuselage skins. Obviously you'll need to build yourself a table around this so that the the part can sit flush. But you typically put the male die on the bottom and the female die on the top. And then using a plastic hammer to create a nice dimple, not hitting it too hard. I want to actually machine countersink something. We'll use this tool threading our bit into the end. This is a number 41 here. And then we adjust the depth of the throat on this to get the correct depth of the countersink that we desire. It's a little iterative process. Obviously be cautious at the beginning. Go ahead and machine countersink your part. As you can see the material is actually removed. We would only do this on parts that are thicker than 40 thou. Then we have a little template here that we can use to make sure that we've countersunk it enough. We want to be cautious, so it's probably not going to be enough at the beginning. Go ahead, readjust the throat, countersink it again until you're happy, 
and then you can go ahead and lock it there and then now you can go ahead and machine countersink the rest of the rivet holes. So various bits. Just an example here again, not an exhaustive list of what you're going to need. Onto riveting tools, here's the pneumatic riveter and the little beehive that's used to contain the various sets. And you'll have various sets that will go into this. Here's a long one for areas where there may not be uh, access. And an offset example, maybe there's a flange in the way or a rib in the way. This is the one you're going to use a lot for flush rivets. Most of the skin rivets are flush, so use that cup set, which has a nice rubber around it. Then you have a back riveting set, and I'll show you a whole video of this later, but this is going to be typically used to rivet stiffeners to a skin, as you'll see here with the bucking plate underneath it. And here's the hand squeezer that we'll use a lot of times when we just have access to the side and they're small 336 inch rivets. Eighth inch rivet is quite challenging uh, with the hand squeezer and that's where the pneumatic's going to come in really nicely. Again, different dies that go on the end. That's for a flush rivet. And then these cupped dies here, this one for an eighth inch domed rivet. And these are going to come in various thicknesses as well. So you see on the right there's a really thin one. Obviously you wouldn't use these two together. Both domed for eighth inch rivets. And there's a domed one for a 332nd inch rivet. So how it would work is you'd have domed on one side and flush on the other. And then you'd squeeze the rivet. In the pneumatic squeezer, we're going to do an entire video on this we're riveting techniques, but again, it's the same where you're going to put the die on each side, and then you're going to adjust the throat of it by screwing it up and down. And again, you need to be very careful with this tool because it's 3,000 PSI. Obviously, you need side access to use these, so for 332nd inch rivets, you can get away with the hand squeezer, but for 8th inch rivets, you're going to really like the pneumatic squeezer. And the black yokes of all these come off with just removing those two little pins. This one here would be for an area where there's where there's a tight access. You can see here it's even been ground down, which is a common thing for tools. Hey, right, bucking bars on the other side. I like the tungsten ones because they're denser. But here are just various shapes. Most of these ones are steel. There's a the tungsten ones in the front uh, right there. But various shapes to uh, get access to the back of the rivet. We'll do a whole video on that. But you're typically going to use this when you don't have access around it. So you have the bucking bar on one side and the rivet gun on the other side. And rivet gauges, last little tool we'll talk about. Just to make sure that you've riveted enough or not too much and how these work is it should always not fit. So it doesn't fit that way means you haven't riveted too much, not too flat. And it won't fit this way either meaning that you've actually riveted it enough and you'll be able to judge that by high. All right, here's the most important tool, so have yourself a little beer fridge, spend some quality time at the hangar. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Like, subscribe, build yourself something, take it for a rip. See you on the next one.